Good morning, Port de Versailles. Um, thanks to you all for getting here good and early. I think a lot of people had late nights, and that's part of the uh, Viva Tech experience. That's one of the reasons we do it in Paris and not someplace less fun. Um, I'm going to just start right in. We've got, as you probably are aware, Publicis Group is one of the major organizers of this event, and so therefore it wouldn't be appropriate to not have a really strong marketing panel. As you all probably know, technology and marketing are, have been on this convergence course, and so we're going to be focusing specifically on digital aspects of marketing. So why don't I just call everybody up? Let's come right up. Let's, let's not waste any time. Uh, hey, guys. Come on. Let's go. Um, let's get Michael all the way on the end. I'm going to start introducing everybody as they come along. I'll leave Michael for last. Marc Mathieu, who is the CMO of Sony North America, although he is French. Give him a good round. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use this mic. Can I have a mic, please? I do not work for Sony. I work for Samsung. Samsung. <laughs> um, Olivier Derrien, Salesforce France and other places. You might wonder why Salesforce is here. The answer is that Salesforce Marketing Cloud, among other things, is a very big piece of the stack. Lumira Rocher from L'Oreal, Chief Digital Officer. Again, another fun question. Why is a Chief Digital Officer in a marketing panel? You'll find out. My old friend Carlo from Google runs Google in Southern Europe. Again, Google runs a rather large piece of advertising and marketing these days. And lastly, Rashad Tabakawala, who some of you will remember from yesterday, chief strategist for Publicis Group and just a great all-round thinker about all these things. And then Michael Kasson, the, uh, the what should we call you? The Pope? The Pope of chief, chief, rabbi. chief Rabbi. OK, Chief Rabbi of the marketing world at large one of the big figures at Cannes, and a great guy to know, and the perfect person to run this panel. So go for it. Good luck. Thank you, Spencer. And thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Marketing as we know it is over. As I look out in the audience, I'm certain that's not a surprise to anyone here. We're already, we've already done away with what we would characterize as marketing 1.0. And we've moved from buying media to buying audiences, and now we're pulling those audiences through flexible, personalized means of communications, rather than pushing out mass messages in predefined ways. As for di digital technology, we're just getting started. Mobile and big data have mostly defined our lives for the past eight or nine years, and we are still today grappling with the changes they've brought. But the flux isn't finished. Artificial intelligence is creating the horizon, heralding computing with understanding, and what is likely and most important, understanding with intuition. With technology moving as fast as ever and audiences being far more adaptable to new technology than marketers have historically been, the pace of change isn't about to let up. In an area of marketing defined by change, marketing rules are useless. Rules are permanent and inflexible, yet we're operating in a world that requires flexibility and agility because what, we worked, what worked yesterday will likely not work today and most certainly will not work tomorrow. The issue I see with this paradigm is that we as marketers often get stuck looking at that as a problem rather than a great opportunity. What's interesting about marketing in 2016 is how many creative ways there are to get at an answer to the business problems posed to us. There is no one way or no single solution. The brands who are owning it today in the marketing world differ wildly from one another in their approaches to solving these problems. The diversity of approaches is astounding. But as diverse as their approaches are, when you dig down into these companies, there are commonalities in the structures created to support and facilitate new processes in innovation, in younger workforces, in body and mind, and in thinking differently. So if we do away with the rules of marketing and start thinking in terms of guidelines, something that is malleable, that has the generosity to it and permissiveness, let's examine the commonalities, the internal structures and processes that foster mindsets where rule bending and breakage is allowed, where change is accommodated and new ideas are created. Look to models that defy 
uh, that deftly marry scale with agility, that allow room for strategy with responsiveness, and that allow for the opportunity to have a conversation with the five folks that I have here on the panel. So with that, I'm going to turn over uh, conversation into questions. I'd like to begin with Mark, uh, who, to reiterate, is from Samsung, not from Sony. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mark, we just were in Cannes together, and Samsung had quite a, uh, a large presence and a large display dealing with VR. You're a traditional marketer. We've worked together in, for many years when you were at Coca-Cola, when you were at Unilever. So in addition to a traditional marketer, you're a good friend. You're now in, in a much more technology-focused arena. Talk to me about the, the virtual reality uh, experience that you were creating at Cannes for advertisers and marketers, et cetera. Just talk about the kind of the yeah. background. So uh, one of the things that's interesting about, about Samsung is that contrary to, to your point about my previous you know, lives uh, in marketing is that uh, a lot of companies have a marketing playbook and they beat it to death you know, and apply it to the letter. And at Samsung, we tend to do exactly the opposite. I mean, we have quite a few savvy marketers. I have inherited and brought, uh, I've been there one year, brought uh, additional you know, skill set. But we constantly re reinvent the playbook. So there is not a week going on without us saying, oh, we've never done this. And, uh, and that's exciting as opposed to that scary. Uh, VR specifically, we believe, is a game changer. It's a game changer for us, but it's a game changer for marketers. It's a game changer for businesses. So what we try to do at Cannes, where we had the whole both advertising as well as uh, marketing brands industry, is to showcase how virtual reality was potentially only at its infancy and how it could be uh, interpreted for brands to do what you know, marketers try to do with their brands, which is build deep engagement and immersive experiences with their audiences. So we really believe that there is a huge opportunity to use virtual reality and 360 uh, content to actually create a, a deep, immersive, virtual reality-based experience connection uh, with, the, with people. Is that the holy grail now? We, we, we talk about engagement in so many ways. We talk about engagement in terms of time spent uh, looking at uh, display or whatnot. Is, is, that the, is, this, is this the holy grail for engagement? We've really drawn the consumer into this, to our reality, to their reality? Whose reality are we in? Well, it's, it's not the holy grail, it's a new frontier. And so there, there, there has been very little uh, of us in this room who have actually experienced the birth of a new medium. If you think about it, the last breakthrough in terms of medium was the invention by the Lumiere brothers of uh, cinema. And now we are going back you know, beyond the frame. We've been locked into a frame in terms of content, whether it was in pictures or in films or everything has been within you know, the perimeter of a, of a portrait, of a frame. And today we go back to 360, uh, and that changes the, the relationship you can have with, with the world, with, one, with others, and with yourself. And that's why it's a new frontier in terms of uh, connections and engagement. Lubomira, you, uh, as Spencer introduced you, you were a marketer, and now you're a chief digital officer. I'm not sure that I draw any distinction between the two. Uh, but I'm curious if you do, number one, but as a marketer um, on this, in, in this conversation, are you starting to build virtual reality into your thinking, into the plans you do with your partners, with your agencies, with, with uh, content creators? Is virtual reality becoming part of it? So two questions. Do you see a distinction between being a chief marketing officer and a chief digital officer? And then, you know, moving over to the, to the virtual reality question. I think that um, what I always say is that digital marketing is dead and we are now marketing at the digital age. People don't go on digital, they live on digital. This is really what they do every day. And this is where our brands need to engage with them in a meaningful, organic and powerful way. So uh, I, think, I, I think that digital, what digital imposes to us is really to be super consumer centric. 
because if you don't really understand, before you had like maybe three, four touch points, right? Where you need to be really strong and create great content. Today you have dozens, hundreds. So if you're not super consumer centric, if you don't understand exactly, especially in digital, where people are spending their time and what they do there, basically you have 100% chances to make all the wrong investments. So yeah, I think that's the first point. And the second point is on virtual reality. Of course, virtual reality is super interesting for us. Uh, we are starting to experiment uh, with, uh, with a lot of experiences, especially in our B2B business. We are using a lot of VR to train our hairdressers. Uh, into the, the way to, uh, to do a proper coloration, to do a proper haircut, and uh, to virtualize the whole um, salon experience. So this is the first application we are doing. And of course, considering it, it many things, especially in tutorials, and it's, I'm sure it's going to be great. We'd love to help. Oh. <laughs> I have a date. Carlo, um, it, we're talking about virtual reality. Uh, a, a, a tenant for, for Google these days is around artificial intelligence. Do, where, where do where, do you see do you see just kind of riff a little on on artificial intelligence as it plays in the world of marketing? You you've you know but, arguably sitting at the uh, largest uh, seller of advertising in the world today, I think. Well, I prefer to talk about machine learning. Uh, what we define as artificial intelligence is intelligence is a very complex concept. I think the reality today is machines crunch a lot of data and machine learning is about transforming this data into information. And if we do a parallel with marketing, I think the first change was with the internet arrived the interaction. We started interacting much better one with another and thus, and thus we could interact better with the consumers. And there came performance marketing, right? and Google and those kind of things. In this phase, we realize that the interaction with consumers and the way the services are built allows to dispose of a significant level of data. But what to do with those data, how to manage them is complex and how to treat them is difficult. So many companies are developing algorithms that interpret that data, like what we do, for example, with the uh, translation systems. They learn from the quantity and they translate better and better, as Eric was saying yesterday on the stage. So I do believe that it's very important to discuss about how data management should be performed, how data should be shared among companies and, pe and what is fair and what should be and should not be done, so that we benefit from the potential of interpreting the data sharing them and developing even more performing marketing services. Uh, interaction is a first step. Now, if we interact and we have data, the interaction will bring even more value. And this value is something that has to be somehow provided to advertisers through the good work of, of, of all the sector. Uh, Olivier, um, when Spencer introduced you, he talked about the fact that you were um, here representing Salesforce, and Salesforce has a ubiquitous presence here. I walked around the hall and see Salesforce quite prominent uh, in, 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 in this Viva technology. Having the for good fortune of working with Salesforce for many years, I know when you started this transition, uh, I want to say it's about five years ago, uh, the transition that Mark Benioff began moving Salesforce from a cloud computing company to a cloud computing company that also worked in the marketing cloud, actually one of the creators of it. And, and I think when we were chatting in the, in the ready room, uh, you and I participated in that Palm Springs, California uh, conversation where it was imperative for Salesforce to understand the difference between your general client being the chief technology or the chief information officer, and as you navigated and built the marketing cloud, your chief client might be Mark Matu, a chief marketing officer. You needed to get a different, uh, a, a different orientation to sell to a chief marketing officer the services and the goods versus a chief technology officer. Could you chat about that a bit in terms of the journey? Yes, of course. Uh, in fact, we have the mission to be a little bit ahead of the game and to guide our customers. 
So we realized uh, 10 years ago that it was not about uh, only the sales team being customer centric, but it's a company agenda. How, to, how can you connect more to your own customers? And it's, uh, it's uh, different people in the organization that do that. And uh, service people, marketing people, have, uh, I see the end of a marketing. It means it's also the beginning of a more personalized, more real time, more, uh, let's say, uh, impactful marketing. So we invested a lot in acquiring a, a company. Now we have a conversation with a lot of uh, chief digital officers or chief marketing officer to uh, define a more uh, impactful marketing. I mean, define the customer journeys and come back to the time of my grandmother. You know, uh, we were here last week with uh, 7,000 customers in the same place. One of our customers named La Durée was telling us, listen, when my grandmother created the company, there were two core values, quality of products, but also quality of service. They had 10 customers, and the grandmother knew everybody in the customers, knew the dogs of the family. And now, because of the digital revolutions, it's an exciting time, because the technology will enable companies like L'Oréal, or uh, La Durée, or Louis Vuitton, uh, with millions of customers, to know them very well, and to use, to benefit from that, in order to give a personalized one-to-one -one service. This is why our company has the mission to invest a lot and being ahead of the game. And recently, two weeks ago, we announced the acquisition for $2.8 billion of e-commerce demand where, because all our customers have uh, shops, physical shops, but they also have electronic shops, and they want the same service, the same experience for their customers. Did, have you found that the chief marketing officers dress better than the chief technology officers? I know this isn't really an important point. I'm no, just curious. It's, it's not a question of dressing code. It's a question of value to the company and to their customers. Good. I'm just checking. Yeah. Mark, you were going to say well, something. No, I, what I was going to say, I think uh, you bring up a, a good point, which is the fact that as companies and brands became bigger, uh, the original one-to-one -one customer service, customer relationship, has actually, the human interaction, has actually gone down in quality. Yep. And uh, funnily enough, I often say that uh, technology, despite uh, everything that you, you may think, is probably playing a role in making us more human again. Yes. And enabling us to personalize uh, the, uh, the service and the interaction to a level of quality, which we had a little bit forgotten or given up because of scale. And now, because of data, because of uh, contextualization, personalization, because tomorrow of artificial intelligence, we're going to need, we're going to be able to actually do a much more one-to-one -one and, and hopefully human relationship service to people. Yeah, you want to have the smart conversation, the right conversation at the right time in the right channel. It's a huge opportunity. At the same time, it's a challenge because as a consumer, you are less patient. If you receive the wrong message on the wrong channel, you are going to stop with the brand very rapidly. So it's a, it's a big opportunity and a big challenge at the same time. When, when you talk about that, and I'm curious, anybody can answer this question, but when you talk about that, we, we strive, of course, to find the right consumer at the right time on the right device with the right message yep. in, in a contextual way. I mean, yep. as marketers all, we know the importance of that. But for the last couple of years at MediaLink, we've been focusing on the other part of the other side of the story, which is in marketing, there is still, I hope, an opportunity for serendipity. There's still that opportunity to reach somebody not at the right time, but at a time when it becomes the right time. You know, we all, if you're in the auto manufacturing business, you want to get the person when they're in market for a car. But what about the time that they're not in market for a car? You see a picture of a car, you get a message about a car, and you go, you know what? I think it might be time for a new car. H how do you manage those two things? I don't think one excludes the other. I don't think, I think branding will always remain important, and you'll do more branding activities, forgetting the moment or the state of mind of the person, and sales messages more in the context of is ready to buy a car. And I think it's a great opportunity for brands to have the possibilities of separating the two more and being much more specific. And this is what data crunching, data management can provide you. It's, a, it's, it's more choice for 
people who want to sell or defend their brand, not less. But I think that um, for me, digital is all about access and utility and, uh, and context. And back to your point on artificial intelligence, what I see uh, coming, and it's super interesting, if you think of, uh, of it as a deep neural uh, network and stuff like that, it's really disrupting many things. Uh, doctor, doctor diagnostic, right? It's disrupting finance and services. But it, it's going to disrupt something big for us, especially in CPG, which is prescription. Today, prescription, I mean, you get prescription because you're the richest guy in town. So you put a lot of media, you carpet bomb Jane Doe, and then you create this brand preference, which is printed in her mind, right? Um, but with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, bots, whatever you call it, but all those algorithms, what, what we will be able to do is really to learn about you, about where you are in that particular moment, uh, what you think, what you have seen, and then prescribe you something which is so much more powerful, so much more personalized. And this I see, talking about the end of marketing, I think this is something absolutely huge because we will not need to promote anymore. We will just earn the right because we know the guys, to make the right prescription at the right moment based on the history of what I did. So we are all investing, sorry, on, on machine learning. We are all innovating. I'd like to add that uh, innovation has to rhyme with simplicity, we think, because we need to give to every consumer or customer a simple experience. And it's not so easy to rhyme uh, innovation, and sim especially in France, where it's a, a land of innovators, but not always a land of simplification. Go ahead. Well, I would like to react to that. To me, the change we see now in innovation is that innovation, if you would want to take a formula, is a function of collaboration multiplied per openness divided by the risk perceived. Wow, it's a simple formula. Yes, very easy. The higher the risk is perceived, the less you collaborate. The less you collaborate, yeah. the less you're open. Result, the less you innovate. I think nobody can do anything alone anymore. And yeah. this is what we see in the current world. So yes, marketing is changing because in the past, you were bringing your product to the market somehow with, with a sales force directly or, or indirectly, but trying to control the mechanism. Today, it changes. You, are, you, you must be more open. You collaborate with different people. You create things with other people. And you innovate by partnering. Let me give you an example of our, one of our customers, Bouygues Telecom. They have decided to simplify in France the, uh, the interfaces between uh, the marketing people doing campaigns, between the service people in the contact centers, between the point of sales people in the boutiques, and even the customer now has the same interface. Their innovation is rhyming with simplicity. W one would argue the customer has more input than, than any of those people on But the But they share the same interface, and it's giving more quality of service and more efficiency to the entire system. No question about it. And, and it, it's important you make that, that, uh, that point. Uh, six or seven years ago, uh, a CEO of one of the largest consumer packaged goods companies in the world asked me a question, yep. again, six or seven years ago, and said, do I really need to be concerned about social media? Again, seven years ago. And I said, well, uh, I was taught something by a mentor that if you have an opportunity to talk to your client, talk to your customer, you should always take advantage of it. I said, if you look at social media as nothing other than a very large scale way to talk to your customer, to talk to your consumer, to talk to the L'Oreal customer, to the Samsung customer, you want that opportunity, yeah. you need that dialogue because the consumer is very much a part of the conversation today. You can be proactive now. You have no choice. Yeah, but you need to change the way you do it. I think what, what internet also taught us is that execution matters more than ideas. Execution is fundamental. And today, as customers, we are all much more advanced in our lives in the usage we do of tools than in our office. I don't know, Lubomira, what you think of that, but I, I, I would believe that there is still a tendency to say I'm more advanced as a consumer in, in how I use technology than in the, in the office I work for. Maybe not at Google, but so that point, quality of execution, and the fact that we need to talk to the customer in a way that he accepts is important. I, I, Try to I, sell me I, champagne I, yeah, at 7 a.m. in the I'm morning. I'm sorry, I can't let you say, uh, I agree that execution matters, but I can't let you say that execution matters more than ideas. I think that in the digital age, ideas matter more than ever. 
because if you don't have an idea-centric uh, you know, uh, tactic or execution, then people are going to you know, find it boring, and you need to be surprised and delight. Back to your point of serendipity, you need to, to find a way to touch people. There is such a, a, a competition of, uh, of uh, in people trying to get your attention. Uh, so I think both matter, ideas and execution. But for me, the question is not ideas versus execution. The question is that we have changed the way to do it, especially if you take CPG. The way we were communicating with our customers were like, oh, I have a product launch, so maybe I should do some big TVC and a print, and then I was talking, and then go silent. And then boom. And then, oh, I have a new product launch, and then I'm going to boom, and boom. And today, especially in the age of social networks, what's really important is the, this always-on versus campaign-based yeah. Uh, marketing and I think that's really huge and uh, as I always say like 365 is the new 360 well it, you, you set up a perfect question for uh, Rashad I've known Rashad for more years than I'd like to count and for all those years I've thought he was one of the smartest people that I had ever met uh, he proved that again last October when he really kind of nailed it in terms of what we're talking about, the idea or the execution. But the place that Rashad nailed it was talking about data. And we were in a meeting together and he talked about the importance of data. I keep quoting him on this and I've told him I need to start paying him a royalty. Uh, but it, it, what Rashad talked about was the utilization of data or the owning of data It was very much like oil. If you have it, it's great, but it's not worth much unless you refine it. So it's almost the same conversation. The ideation without the execution, it's a tree falling in the forest. If nobody's there, it doesn't make a sound. Rashad, can you talk about your view of that? Because again, data monopolizes every conversation in our industry, and yet I think you nailed it when you said having it isn't any good if you don't refine it. So I think the a lot of what we talk about has already been solved and we keep repeating it again and again. So for instance, a poet a long time ago basically said, water, water everywhere, so much water. Water, water everywhere, all the boards will shrink. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink because the person wasn't sitting in the sea. I basically say data, data everywhere, so much data we will sink. Data, data everywhere, please, who will help me think? The reality of it is refinement of data is far more important than just ownership. No company, including Google or Facebook, have enough data. Because the reality of it is human beings are much broader than the use of one brand or one platform. And if somebody pins me down with data, I will actually not like that brand. Because I'm a human being and I'm not completely defined, which is one of the key things. The other is increasingly marketing is changing. You know, We talk about the end of marketing. I think marketing is being outsourced to the person. I don't even call it a customer. I don't call it a consumer, because I don't believe people define themselves as consumers or customers. I don't believe they have time to have relationships with the people they love. They barely want to have a relationship with a brand. And I think we have to think about the fact that marketing, we do to ourselves. We have outsourced marketing to ourselves. We basically use search engines. We use social media. We go to friends. You know, we talked about VR. I agree it's going to be extremely important. And I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Samsung's equipment, and I think they announced about 85 hours of uh, virtual reality at the Olympics, just for, you know, Samsung gear. I think virtual reality is like an empathy machine. It basically allows you to understand things much, much better, and it allows you to tell stories. And I think we have to understand that human beings define themselves by telling stories to themselves. And how do brands play a role in telling our own stories? And that is sort of where I think the future is, where the thing is upside down. Everything we know, the opposite is true. It's more about access than ownership, more about self-marketing than marketing. And therefore, it is the end of marketing. But to your point about data, so I, I, I like what you said about saying, you know, nobody has enough data, yet at the same time, we don't know what to do with data to make it you know, useful, simple, in a simple way. So we recently launched this phone in the spring, which is great, low light you know, camera. It also happens to be water resistant. Uh, and uh, the beauty, what did we do with this? Okay, so we actually created the social Nothing posting. like a live demonstration, it's yeah, it always. It does work, okay. We, uh, we actually did um, uh, posting 
together with the Weather Channel to actually post uh, uh, messages to people when it was actually going to rain, telling them, is your phone you know, ready for the rain in their city, or when at the end of the day, they were ready to go for you know, the night where a lot of pictures happen and telling them, sunset soon, you know, is your phone ready for the night? 650 to 2,000 more effectiveness than you know, other social posting. But the reason for that is because it was very simple data. It was not even proprietary data. You know, the time of the day and uh, the weather. But it was relevant to people, so it didn't intrude into their life, it actually made sense. Absolutely, and to a great extent, what mobility has done, whether you have a waterproof, and I have one of those, a waterproof or not waterproof phone, is a lot of what we learned in marketing is who somebody is matters a lot. Increasingly, where somebody is matters as much as who they are. And that was a case of where you are because nothing is as in increasingly relevant as where you are. So whether it's like, you know, uh, now Google Now or anything else, it works on location. And if you know where it, you are, it's, I think, even more important than who you are. And it, just imagine all of marketing has been built on demos, right? And now the new data basically says the demos matter less and less. Carlo, Carl, I, I want to go back to something. Several years ago, um, a, a, an author, Ken Oletta, wrote a book called Googled, and it talked about the history of Google. Mm -hmm. And it has a particular paragraph, particular chapter that talks about Mel Karmazin, who at the time was running Viacom and CBS and was a senior executive in the marketing industry. And he visited with Larry Page and Sergey Brin and they walked him through the brilliance of the algorithm and the, and, and the brilliance of being able to find back to what we were talking about, the right consumer, the right time. The, so here's a publisher, here's a seller, a very large seller at the time, listening to how the world was going to become perfect. And I guess it's uh, past 10 o'clock, so I can say it. He famously looked at Larry and Sergey and said, don't fuck with the magic. We've been, we've, been, we've been selling this the way we've been selling it for a long time. Do we really need the precision? Has the marketplace gotten there yet? I think, again, human in the center. Data isn't information. And as you said, refining data is what makes it information, like you do with oil. And I think what we realize more and more is we have interesting touch points. Knowing the location is an interesting touch point. But in order to use that touch point, you must be oriented to the service you provide to the consumer, so the user, or whatever we want to call him. And this requires more and more forms of collaboration and working with others. Uh, if I think at my company now, and I see what we do in working with automotive companies to develop the driverless car, or in pharmaceuticals to fight diabetes, uh, and it, it, it also is true in marketing with the programmatic platforms, is sharing data with the right people, with the respect of the customer, with the authorization of the customer, but sharing this data is what allows to create the right message at the right moment and, and, and have the magic. The magic is the excitement of the user because he reads something that he likes. The magic is the emotion that you can convey. And data can help you do that better, do that in a more relevant way, and do that in a more respectful way, if we create the right environment to share it in the respect of users. But I think that data without context is nothing. You can yeah. have piles and piles and stocks and stocks of data, but if you don't have the context, your data is useless. Yeah, I mean, when listening to all this remark, uh, I think it's a new way of collaborating with your customers. Ideas are also coming for the customers. So it's a way to, uh, to speak with them, to put them in the same community to have the best ideas. It changed the way to work with everybody, including internally in every company. And this is super important. It's not the future, it's, it works today. But the winners are the ones who are able to implement these technologies step per step with winning projects, with win, rapid wins, and it works. It works. As, as we look at 
the end of marketing as we know it, I want to switch over to content. So today, most marketers that we speak with talk about the importance of content. They talk about it from three different aspects. They talk about the creation of it, the distribution of it, and the potential monetization of it. So every brand today fancies themselves a publisher. If, if again, as marketers, Mark and, 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 and all of you, because you're all marketers in some way, shape, or form, do you look at a, a difference between the word content and the word commercial messages? How, how, do you, how do you look at it as a marketer? I would say that content is absolutely key, especially, I mean, it's not news to anybody in the room uh, in the context of ad blocking, etc. Why, why are people ad blocking? They are not ad blocking to uh, piece us off, right? They are ad blocking because they believe that we, as an industry, have provided them messages that were not super interested, not super relevant, and super intrusive. So this is why they are doing it. So the question is more like what type of format are going to win the heart of our consumers? And what we see is that people are, cre it's, not be it's not that be because people are ad blocking that they, are, that they don't want to have a relationship with brands. Because when we provide them cool content, entertaining, useful, um, uh, that, that provide them value, they love it. I mean, we have platforms in L'Oréal like makeup.com, like skincare.com, like maquillage.com, like Secreto de Salao, Secret of Salon. And those platforms are really working because we are providing them a lot of uh, meaningful, uh, meaningful content. And why content is important? Because we live in an age where you can't, as a marketer, continue to rent audiences forever. You need to build your own audiences. You need to build your own assets. And why is it important? Because of data. Because if you don't build your own audiences, if you don't, have, if you don't own your own data, to a certain extent, you're blind. And then you cannot precision advertise. So content for me is the first step of a digital strategy because it triggers interest, it builds audiences, it gives you the data where you can precision advertise, and then you can drive those guys to buy shampoos. I think we have the duty to revert the logic. If we go back in the past, we didn't know a lot about consumers, so we were centered more on ourselves in marketing. I present myself, my company, what I sell. Today, because we have data, the more you know about someone, the more you owe respect to that person because you enter into something that's more intimate and you know things. That respect to me is increasing customer orientation. Because you know about people, where they are, who they are, what they do, your content changes. You are more interested in them. You are more ex externally focused and less focused on yourself. And I think this is a very beautiful part of what we are living in marketing. We all become less self-centered and more centered on the user. It's very positive and actually it is a new form of magic if you want. Rashad, um, from your perspective, you have the, the luxury and the privilege of working with all the verticals. You work with technology, you work with consumer packaged goods, you work with financial services. You, I mean, there's, there's no vertical that Publicis does not have an important position uh, in, 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 in that vertical. Are you seeing any particular areas, again, not necessarily by client name, but by vertical, uh, that is embracing content in, in, in a more meaningful way. And then I do want to get to the uh, second part of that question, but that would be my first. So I think as, as my fellow panelists have mentioned, content is important and continues to grow very important. And it's true across all categories, but how categories use it is very different. And for instance, um, there are a lot of people who would love to see a 60-minute ad, not even thinking it's an ad on how to make your face up. They don't consider it to be advertising. They consider it to be content. On the other hand, if I want to know how to restart my phone, I want that in 30 seconds, and I consider that to be content. So it's very different from place to place. And I think the reason why contents become important is tr traditionally, until about a decade ago, the way marketing worked is we basically looked at the consumer as a cow, okay? It was a cow in a stall. We sent it messages, and we milked it. Then one day, the cow basically got a mobile phone and went away. 
right? And so now we have to basically find grasp. It gives new meaning to the idea of calling it in, right. for sure. So now we basically have to find grass for them to go graze on, which is what content is to a great extent, right? And they will find their own content. But the reality of it is we no longer are basically sending messages to cows and pumping milk out of them. They have a mobile phone. They've gone out there, and we've got to go find them. So I think content matters, but it's a loop. It's not only content. It's, uh, it triggers a, a new way to do services. Customers are, need the right service at the right time, so they need to be able to self-service themselves or to speak with other customers easily to get answers. Or they need able to push in this, uh, in this phone, to push a button and to speak immediately on a video with, with somebody. I have another customer in mind, TurboTax. They were doing their tax uh, via the phone in, in America. 15 million of them in the last week were doing that using the phone. Using the phone, 15 million. And we had 2 million minutes of video of just pushing the button, one question, immediate answer. You know, it's a combination of things. The value is a combination and the integration of all that. It's not only one or the other. This is so important. It's end to end. The, the other thing, so when we come at Samsung to content, one thing that is happening right now because of virtual reality and 360, more and more we see ourselves not just as a content creator, but as a content enabler. So uh, we've kind of like opened up our platform, Samsung VR, both to the general public as a user generated uh, platform, also for brands to create their own VR channel uh, uh, on it. And, uh, and what we do, we actually facilitate the, the creation of content. So at VidCon, for instance, this week, uh, last week, sorry, I'm losing track of the week. We, um, uh, we had uh, Casey Neistat, who is kind of like one of the uh, YouTubers, uh, run uh, work sessions. We've been enabling him for the last several months to actually use 360 camera uh, and, to, and to tell his own story. And that's the power of it, is that instead of us telling our story, we let, we let audiences tell their stories through 360. And I think more and more, to your point about you know, uh, the audience is, is more and more playing a key role and wants to play a part, the ability of us to get a little bit out of the way as a brand, and instead of telling our story, letting people tell their stories with our products being part of it is much more powerful. Well, that's how you stop renting the audience. That's how you start to own the audience in, in, in a different way. Um, let's talk about the utilization of data, because again, we're talking about marketing, and most often, the conversation about data ends up being in media conversations. Let's switch over to the data and the utilization of it in the creative process. I think that's an important consideration. I had the privilege of uh, doing a fireside chat in Cannes last week with Leslie Moonves, uh, who runs CBS, obviously, and we talked about uh, content decisions and how much of that is still based on your gut, on your kind of intestinal sort of fortitude and sensibilities. And he said something to the effect of uh, algorithms can't, you know, dictate taste. How are we using data as marketers? to inform the creative process, again, separate from the media process? So data is extremely important for creativity. And despite what people believe, it actually is being increasingly used. The first reason is, I remember when I was an account person for many years, the creative department would say, if you give me a really tight strategy, it lets me free. And a very tight strategy is who are you speaking to, where are you speaking to them, and what's the right context. That's one way we now have much more data to be able to tell that story. That's number one. Number two is the thing that people who create messages love is feedback. Right? We know that. When we put out messages, we want to see do people like it, what comments have they made. The same thing is true with the creative community. They you love don't, you don't need to wait till Monday morning anymore. You can find right. out. They love feedback, and I think one of the most powerful things in the world is a very simple thing called A-B testing. Guys, can you just show, show hands? How's he doing? He wants feedback. He's right. doing a great so, job, right? So, Come on. It's, so it's, it's basically, you. It's, it's, you, you basically have A-B testing, which the whole idea is you can try lots of different messages 
or themes and move you know, from that, which is also very important. And finally, one of the most amazing things about the, the, the world of data as it sort of feeds in the world of creativity is data actually adds to the message and the marketing, which is what people don't realize is now we have this little wonderful thing called an application protocol interface, which is you can actually pull in data into your messaging to make it extremely relevant. So data and creativity work hand in hand. It's the alchemy of how you marry them, but it's not independent. So, I mean, um, John Hegarty, who I respect a lot, says data kills creativity, and, uh, and data kills creativity. And, uh, and uh, on one hand, you know, too much data and too much focus on data could kill creativity. I can, you know, b believe that. But I really believe, to your point, that it can also serve both immediate, you know, creative iterations as well as very rich uh, experiences. So creative iteration, for instance, we have a, a, a live command center where we monitor all our product launches, and we have about you know, 15 to 20 screens. We, we also make screens, so we don't, you know, they're cheap for us. So we have about 20 screens where we pull all kind of data, and every day we, we look at all the data to actually iterate the content decisions that we need to make for the following days. And given the pace of the, you know, the industry, we, we, we have you know, rapid iteration of creative, uh, and that's helping us a lot. When it comes to big creative, I think there are still very few cases where really you see data uh, at the center of the idea. One of my favorite is, um, uh, I think it's a couple of years ago, so proves that I don't have that many examples in uh, Piccadilly Circus, where you had British Airways take the billboard and uh, you had a, a little child walking and pointing at the sky on the planes that were coming across London about to, lead, to land at, at Heathrow. And based uh, on a huge access to data, they were actually able to say where the plane was coming from, at what time it was going to land. They didn't tell you whether your mother or your, you know, your children were in there, probably for privacy reasons, but they probably could have. So it was a, a great way of showing a very creative usage of a data-enabled execution. I think the point is, I mean, the, the real difference is the real-time aspect. And I think that uh, today when you, when you run a campaign, the difference is that you can have like every second a feedback on your campaign and how it's working. And then it enables you to take decisions. For example, we, were, we launched like two years ago um, an LCF shampoo called Fibralogy. So we launched it and we had banners and videos and all that stuff. And what, what the data uh, allowed us to, it was of course targeted to women, right? And what the data allowed us to see is, was that male were clicking on it. Like men were far more interested in that particular product than women were. And so the question for us as marketers became like, do we want to change the packaging? Do we want to change the, the creatives? Or do we want to change our strategy? And actually we decided to change the strategy and we went all in for men. But I think that this real time aspect of it is super interesting and this is uh, like uh, what the, the modern tools allow us to do. I would like to insist a little bit on the changes technology is bringing to creativity. If you think about it, the world of apps, of mobiles, of interactivity, offer to creatives lots of opportunities of, of changing the messages. You can use video, you can use audio, you can use a mix of it, you can create the message with your user. I think the possibilities of creating are much more complex than what they were some time ago. And again, with the fact that we have this connectivity continuously and we can interact with each other continuously, creativity can experiment new things. And you also can have a relationship with your users, with your customers, that's much more intimate because of that. So yes, creatives have a great challenge at the moment. But I don't think that all the data and the possibilities are limiting creativity. I think they are multiplying it and changing the possibilities of interacting with users. Yeah. yeah, I have two comments, I mean, in my mind. I mean, the first one is uh, linked to the data. It has to enable everybody to engage at the right time with the customers. Data is not only alone again. It's, uh, it has to be uh, your command center is 
is going to be super efficient if you have the possibility to automatically or in real time yeah, engage with the right customer with the right message. So it's this notion of uh, engagement I think is super important. And in terms of creativity, I think we're here in an event where startups are uh, at the heart of it. And in France, all what we're talking about, I mean, we have a lot of engineers, and I see, I see a lot of creativity from a lot of young entrepreneurs who are using their own creativity to assemble, to refine everything we're saying between the data in one hand, the software in the other hand, the handset. You know, there is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs, like French entrepreneurs, to become successful. And it's good. It's good. It's exciting for France. T talking about one topic we've not discussed, which Please. is partnerships. And uh, you talk about you know, data, and, and it's true that my data plus your data is richer than just my data. Because by the way, it's not neither your nor mine, it's people's data. But if we put our strengths together, what we understand, then we can create experiences for people that are uh, much more meaningful. And so thanks to digital, to technology, to data, we actually are evolving. I mean, you know it because the younger generations are much more collaborative than you know, the older generation have been. Speaking we, as part of the younger generation, yeah, I would exactly. agree with that. <laughs> and we, no, but we had a, an, an industry between the manufacturers and the advertising industry that were very much a closed you know, loop. And today, it's much more open, much more collaborative, and there's many more opportunities in this new marketing for partnerships, which I think is exciting, actually. Well, but including with entrepreneurs, including with startups. I'm a, I'm a huge believer. And uh, when I was at Unilever before Samsung, I created the Unilever Foundry, which is the, the, the uh, uh, tech startup platforms of Unilever. And I really believe that the partnership with startups is one of the way to experiment the marketing evolution, the next frontiers of marketing. You, you say that, Mark, and I agree with you. And I think the collaboration and the partnerships are key. And my data is your data as you say it's actually the consumer's data. But there are those who think, and I, I can't help but say it, that we're in a duopoly world. Uh, somebody referred to the beach in Cannes as duopoly beach, where Facebook and Google uh, you know, dominated the quasette. Um, is there oxygen left for anybody else if, if you put Facebook and Google uh, next to each other on the beach? Well, Because we're gasping for breath now. Facebook and Google both grew through partnership, through creating and working with an ecosystem. If you see the number of startups that today can grow and become multinationals because they use the technologies and services that companies like Facebook and Google provide, I think you get a better picture of the world. Uh, I think the reality is those internet companies become big because they distribute, redistribute through their partners big part of the revenue they create. And it's all about working with others and partnership and being open. After all, the internet is a language. It's the first time, if you think about it, that all over the world, machines understand each other. In the past, it was big mainframes, then it became PCs, now it's mobile phone, and now it's internet of things. It's all about openness and collaboration. And I think the success of companies like Facebook and Google is due to the fact they had that openness and collaboration mentality since the start. I, I, would, I, I would basically sort of build a little bit on the fact that while Facebook and Google are very important, they're just part of the story. First of all, from a global perspective, there are people who will actually be later on the stage like Baidu and Tencent, uh, and there are several others. I believe companies like Samsung should not be underestimated with what they are going to do. Um, companies like Apple, but that's just in the technology space. But there's a lot more. And there are these other things that are creeping from nowhere that people don't pay attention to, like Snapchat. And fundamentally, I think it's anybody who believes that they're going to be, going to be two people haven't seen the, his, the lessons of history. Because in the end, marketers like oligopolies. They don't like duopolies. They don't like perfect competition. And so there will be a tendency, if you notice in marketing, five or six large players in every category. But I think this whole debate is a false debate. Because at the end of the day, those guys uh, who are calling the duopoly beach or whatever, I mean, those are frustrated guys. The question is, why are those guys having so much data? Because they do provide a real utility. 
Facebook is providing an amazing utility because it allows me to connect with my loved ones and my friends and my family. Google provides a huge utility. Snapchat is starting to provide a huge utility. Amazon is providing a huge utility. You know, all those guys are providing utility. So instead of like, oh shit, those guys should give them our, uh, should give us their data, or oh la la, it's too bad they have a lot of don't, data. Don't get me wrong, I, mean, I drank uh, their rosé on the beach. Uh, I was very just, happy to be on that beach. I'm just making it provocative. The thing is, instead of complaining, we should, as marketers, ask ourselves the question of what are the services we need to build. Yeah. I, I think to, you're bringing a great To acquire point. the data. Look at Nike. I mean, Nike did a great job with the Nike Plus stuff. Uh, we are doing a good job with the Makeup Genius application, and we get a lot of data through that because we provided a real service to our consumers, and this is the real thing. So if I can on this, because I think you're bringing up two points which are fundamental to the theme, the end of marketing as we know it. The first one is brands are not built anywhere, anymore the same way. Brands used to be built by a big message that you pushed at people and you were hoping afterwards, you know, enjoy, that you were going to go and, you know, buy, you know, their products. And now they are, they are built through multiple micro interactions, multiple times a day on people's terms. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's why Google, Facebook, etc., are brands that are all the way up there. It's because think about the number of time you bring Google into your life. Google doesn't intrude into your life. But Gmail, Google Maps, search, the number of time, actually I need data, which is your point about utility. And therefore it's not enough to be just a product brand. It's also you need to be a product, a service, and an experience brand. And one of the things that we try to do at Samsung is to market the totality of you know, our ecosystem of products, services, and experiences, yes, to sell more phones, but unless you think services and experiences, you're only doing half of the job. Uh, as a final question, when we are here next year at Viva Technology Padua, what will we be talking about? Anything different? Will there be something new on the horizon that we haven't thought about yet? I, w I would say that be a couple of things that came up earlier in the conversation will become much more real. One will be this entire area of virtual reality. I think will become much augmented reality, etc. Should we tell them now that we're actually a hologram? We're not really here. Yes, we're, that's okay. sort of one. This and, is the time. And then this entire idea of deep learning as a component of machine learning, which is already very widely appreciated. Uh, because actually, the stuff you see like on Facebook or Google is actually deep learning, already working at it. And I think those two are going to be escalating in the next year. Carlo? Collaboration. I believe we are entering into a, an era of the frontiers between industries are blurring. You are in automotive or L'Oreal as well. You change fundamentally the way you think. Shall I? In which sector am I? Because technology is a bit like salt. It's permeating everywhere. So to me, the next stage is a new era of collaboration, collaborative innovation. You do it together. You can't do it alone. And I think it will be one of the important themes of the next two or three years. Because it encompasses lots of issues. Uh, you know, how can we create an open world that creates collaboration, makes collaboration possible? We heard yesterday uh, the difference between the US and Europe. And if you think about it, having a market where all speak the same language and have more or less the same laws of 400 million people versus Europe, we need to create an environment where openness and collaboration allow to be competitive and grow. And this is me, the team of the next two years. I would say two things uh, to build on Carlos' point. I think collaboration is absolutely key, and it takes a village to, to make something in digital. And I think that companies, I mean, outside the tech environment where people are already be behaving and are platforms. Salesforce is a platform, Google is a platform, Microsoft is a platform. I think that companies like us, like traditional ancient world companies, will start thinking as platforms. And this is something that's going to be super, super interesting. And the sec being open to other people, come use, use them, use their, use their facilities to build something on, on their particular vertical. So companies as platform. And the second thing is, um, I think that what basically Messenger did uh, some months ago 
is absolutely huge and is as huge as the App Store when it launched. So the whole thing about messaging and about contextual commerce, contextual conversation will be super big. I think we will talk more about uh, customers, customer stories, customer successes. The customer company. No, not, not the company, but the customers, the consumers, their advantage, their benefit because of all, uh, all the different uh, technology. We will talk about augmented reality. For instance, we have uh, funded uh, with uh, 3 million uh, euro a, a startup in France named Augmented Reality with our fund because we believe in that. And maybe we will talk of the next uh, Facebook and uh, Google of the future. Mark? Well, uh, probably, I mean, I walked the floor today and I saw a few VR um, booths or booths on, uh, where there was some VR. It was mostly gaming. And uh, I really think that uh, next year, hopefully, we will have uh, VR much more central to the future of marketing. So uh, brand VR, marketing VR, I think it's, um, and, and not just VR in terms of the virtual world, but also VR as an opportunity to combine the physical and the virtual. One of the things that we've done, which is one of the most successful, for instance, is a, uh, like 4D chairs which we did working together with Six Flags, where you actually have um, you know, a, an experience where through the virtual reality and the chairs movement, and last week you saw it, we launched even surfing in VR with wind and, uh, and water being sparkled to your face. You really have a, an immersive experience that's a combination of you know, what your, your mind imagines based on what you see, but also what your body actually feels based on you know, what's happening around you. And I think that we often separate still in the future of marketing, physical and digital. You said it's, you know, it's marketing in a digital world. Couldn't agree more. And so this idea of physical meets digital is something which I hope is going to be coming more and more to life in the next two to three years. Well, as physical meets digital, uh, our time is up. I want to thank you all for spending uh, the last hour chatting. Uh, I hope marketing as we know it continues just with a new iteration. Thank you and uh, thank you. Round for these guys. Thank you.